in addition to all the debates and initiatives and legislations that are required, I see almost no debate, initiatives, regulations to change educational systems, to change the way we think about the world, to integrate all the things we've been talking about, which basically will allow, in my humble opinion, humans to more likely remain relevant as machines continue to learn fast. And if we don't upgrade ourselves in the organic way, I'm talking about critical thinking, I'm talking about things which our educational systems, the way we're cabled aren't kind of perfect. And so I'm just a little bit concerned with, there's no shortage of debates by the brightest minds, but I'm not seeing a huge focus on that topic of human agency and, and the changes required for society and educational systems. And when there is a debate, I'm not seeing any kind of action around it. And these are not either ors. It's not instead of ethics. It's not instead of other regulation. It's in addition to realizing that that is the thing that we probably have the most mm -hmm. ability to shape how we view the world, prepare for it, and respond in the context of what's happening to AI. That's Roger Spitz, and this is the All Things Risk podcast. Welcome and welcome back to another episode of the All Things Risk podcast. I'm Ben Catanio. I'm your host. This is my show. And so much of what we do on this show is all about something that we might understand intellectually, but is very difficult to embrace in practical terms. That something is uncertainty, which is a fundamental part of our lives. And as a result, in order to live our best lives and to make the best decisions for ourselves and for the organizations and groups with which we are a part, we need to acknowledge uncertainty and sometimes apply different ways of thinking and operating in order to best embrace it and to succeed. And I talk to people on the show who do exactly that. They embrace uncertainty successfully. And these people can be found in almost all walks of life and we can learn from them. And that's what All Things Risk is about. Today is no different. In fact, we go rather deep on this topic. My guest is Roger Spitz. Roger is the president of Tech Essential, an organization focused on climate and foresight strategy that works with the leadership teams of many prominent organizations. He's also the chair of the Disruptive Futures Institute, which is an education platform that teaches us how we can thrive on disruption. He has spent two decades in the world of venture capital and investment banking, advising CEOs and founders. He is based in San Francisco. And for the purposes of this conversation, conversation, Roger is the co-author of The Definitive Guide to Thriving on Disruption, Essential Frameworks for Disruption and Uncertainty. The guide is premised on the fact that disruption is a steady state, but one whose impact is rapidly expanding. It is a very comprehensive and I think well-packaged and very practical set of tools and guides and frameworks and a whole range of other good things for showing us how to be more resilient to this era of disruption and how to seize opportunities. And this involves casting aside assumptions that are no longer true, throwing out old playbooks, rewiring our, our mindset, embracing the unknown, and taking agency over our own futures. This one is a very interesting, nutrient-rich conversation. We get into everything from AI to Zen Buddhism. So let's get into it. Here is Roger Spitz. Roger, welcome to the All Things Risk podcast. It's a pleasure to have you on. Really appreciate you taking the time. And uh, welcome. Wonderful to have you on this uh, lovely, uh, in my time, Friday, rainy afternoon. So <laughs> a bit of, bit of sunshine from across the pond. Thank you. Exactly. No, well, great to be with you, Ben, on uh, All Things Risk. Thanks for the invite. And uh, if it helps, we have a little bit of sun here. So I hope that somehow it might rub off. <laughs> Good stuff. Let's, let's hope. So look, we will get into a range of stuff. And before we do, 
Congratulations on the definitive guide to thriving on disruption. I am thoroughly impressed. Really great piece of work, and we'll talk about it. So from the outset, congratulations. Before we dive into all of that, though, it would be useful if you gave my listeners a bit of background around who you are, what you do, all that good stuff. Yeah, that's great. Well, thanks for the the support, Ben, on the, the publication and that. So I'm Roger Spitz. I'm born in South Africa, so I'm South African originally, left there quite young and spent years as a kid in different countries, including France and, and Monaco, so I speak French. But most of my formative years were, were in the UK, uh, professionally and uh, university, and I qualified as a chartered accountant. So for topics like all things risk, I thought I had pretty much a pretty good grasp of uh, risk and all those elements, and then qualified with, with EY and moved to m and in investment banking, where I spent 20 years, actually. So for 20 years, I was a global head. Well, not for 20 years, but for the latter part of the 20 years, I was global head of M&A for technology sector. Um, so typically advising your decision makers, your, your C-suite, your boards, your shareholders on their most strategic deals. Did that in London, covering globally, externally focused. So I spent some time at BT and other operators, although you weren't a, an advisory client, I don't think, too much, but uh, but spent time with a lot of the sort of TMT uh, ecosystem in media, telecom, and technology. And in 2017, I was asked to spend more time in San Francisco, beef up the team here, and which I did. And at that point, where I thought I had pretty much life figured out in terms of uh, strategy and my own life and what was important for decision makers, I went down a rabbit hole around complexity and systems thinking and futures thinking and foresight. And really, for want of a better word, I hate that word, but I haven't found better, disruption, nonlinear change. Mm. And started realizing that disruption was taking a different shape and was more systemic. And fast forward to today, I decided three years ago to, to kind of move on from investment banking, to take a blank sheet, blank page, and take on a few board positions, write a book, set up a foresight practice. I started really feeling that foresight and futures was an umbrella that captured well the interests I had. And when the pandemic hit, I kind of started talking a bit more from being an M&A mm. stealth banker, because in M&A you really are pretty much stealth because everything you do is confidential and everything. I moved out and started talking about the things that were in the past maybe a bit esoteric around decision-making, uncertainty, complexity, all the topics that are dear to you mm. as well suddenly became zeitgeisty and I got a huge amount of interest as the pandemic hit with the topics I was focusing on and then decided to set up the Disruptive Futures Institute and we're scaling like crazy and getting a lot of interest because the need for organizations, individuals to think differently and to build resiliency around futures intelligence and and just simply adapting to, to a new environment. It's a completely different predicament. So that's really Today, my activities are really foresight practice advisory and Disruptive Futures Institute, which is effectively education. Okay, great. So what prompted you then, this the definitive guide to thriving on disruption? What is the kind of origin story? And, and of course, like when you call something the definitive guide, that's a high bar. And, you know, I, dare I say, you, you've met that bar, but that's that's a very ambitious thing to set out to do. So what was the the origin story of developing a publication like this? Yeah, no, you're right. Listen, the title is very um, arrogant and uh, can kind of backfire and maybe it will or has or what have you. So I, I'm, you know, happy to have the scrutiny of, um, of the world now that it's out. The, the origin story and the reason why I went for a title, which, you know, is, is maybe a bit... Um, but pushing it is is the following. I had started to think very much in the past few years of my professional life as an investment banker in m a that I was with pretty much the world's leading quote unquote decision makers, you know with the biggest, largest, most sophisticated investors, companies, shareholders. They had very articulated strategy under the scrutiny of the markets and and their own kind of stakeholders. And you learn a lot, you pick up a lot. And I was really kind of a little bit surprised when I went down my rabbit hole mm -hmm. to realize the extent to which maybe the reliance on assumptions of a linear, predictable, and controllable world mm -hmm. were just so incorrect. And 
I think it didn't matter for some of the time in 2000 or 2008, every time you'd have a big shock and you'd go back to quote unquote business as usual and there'd be a big write off of a few billions or trillions or whatever. And then everybody would go back with the same kind of um, normal as a sort of, yeah, world's predictable, controllable. And little by little, I started feeling that the cost of relying on those assumptions was going through the roof because of how systemic change is, because of how everything is connected. And that there was a kind of inverse relationship between prediction and uncertainty. And with more uncertainty, and we'll, we'll unpack all that no doubt in a minute, I was kind of feeling, you know what, that assumption or relying on those assumptions is wrong. And companies and organizations and countries are getting away with it, but the cost of getting away with it will, will change. And as I started thinking about all that, I sort of, my rabbit hole led me to probably eight to 10 micro learning courses, the, probably the best in the world for their respective activities from Santa Fe Institute on complexity to, you know, the, the Foresight Institute for the Future, University of Houston for Foresight Strategy, to the D School on Innovation, to MIT on AI, and really just trying to kind of unpack the different constituents of change. And connecting that with my own 20 years in boardrooms and with my new perspective as a kind of foresight strategist or futurist or whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it. And trying to be humble with what we know and what we don't know, I felt two or three things from that exploration around what is out there. One is that, well, there's a lot of kind of bullshit bingo stuff with very <laughs> narrow perspectives on innovation and disruption, which is fine, that's okay. But even when it's very good, things can be quite specialized with sometimes high barriers to entry in terms of being technical, not always connecting the dots between things that are rele relevant and should be connected, but that are not because they've taken a specialist approach and not always thinking about what is the next order implication. Okay, fine. We're saying this, well, what does it mean? What are the next order implications? Mm -hmm. And so I had this idea of seeing how to kind of put it together. And I was starting actually to write a more conventional commercial book, probably called thriving on disruption that wanted to build a broader platform. I was fortunate enough, and we talked in our earlier calls about uh, science fiction. I was fortunate enough to, to meet a young journalist called Lydia Zwin, um, who writes science fiction, who has a PhD in, in humanist topics, who's also a futurist, very deep into emergent tech, transhumanism, just very different perspectives, a few decades younger than me, mm -hmm. different perspectives. And I kind of asked her whether she'd be happy to kind of support me in creating this kind of platform, this idea, scoping out what would be a broader than just a book, especially as the pandemic hit, I really felt that the world was in need of, of unpacking that. I felt that society and humanity was unprepared mm -hmm. to understand the real aspects of our complex, unpredictable, nonlinear world, that the velocity and the trajectory of change and systemic transformations were probably accelerating, that the public and private institutions, whether it's education, governance structures, mm -hmm teams that were meant to kind of protect and guide us were maybe failing society and, and humanity. Mm. Um, and that while the pandemic didn't create our unpredictable world, I mean, you, you also focus very heavily on this and have done so for a long time, it did set off a chain of events or at least set a spotlight on things which maybe people didn't kind of fully realize. And so putting all that together, I really felt that there was a need to approach this quite holistically. What does it mean for leadership structures, for governance structures, for incentive structures, for, for education? What are the unintended consequences around climate and technology and everything we know, both positive and negative? We take life quite neutrally. We try and be balanced. And with humility, what does it mean in terms of the responses we need and the sense making? And so building on the amazing, you know, a lot of what we have in the work is referencing other people and that you know, very little, not much is meant to be proprietary. We, I genuinely felt that I had not seen anywhere something which approaches it quite holistically hmm. in that way. I felt comfortable with the content I had and with Lydia's perspective to, to, to be the architect of something like this. And that with about 15 specialists and people I'd interacted with and where there was a strong affinity and understanding, if I spent enough time with them, um, we could build something like that. And I intentionally didn't go down the route of, you know, oh, you know, Sarah, you write that chapter, John, you write that chapter. It was really mm -hmm. something which I don't think exists much of, which is 100% built bottom up on the assumption of complex, nonlinear, 
unpredictable. What does all that mean? As opposed to sprinkling a bit of innovation, <laughs> a bit of this. And that. Yeah. So, so that was really the, the origin story and why I kind of had the confidence yeah. or arrogance to yeah, say that. Like, no, that, that's great. And one of the things that, you know, strikes me, I, I work in risk management. Every time I see a bit of thought leadership coming from a consultancy, like particularly the big four, but any kind of consultancy, it always starts with, oh, in our, you know, inter increasingly interdependent, uncertain worlds and VUCA and this and that. And, and all of these are terms that get thrown out, but no one really yeah. understands and more importantly, gets to some practical things that practical implications and different ways of doing things. I think also, for example, I've got the Black Swan, uh, one, one of the books on my bookshelves, probably sure. one of the most referred to books, but also the least read. Same with Thinking yeah. Fast and Slow. So th these, yeah. these concepts are out there, but they're very throwaway and it doesn't really seem like there's a lot of stuff out there that really gets to, well, how should we approach decision making? How should we approach our own uh, personal lives? How should we think about governance? And so what I'm impressed with, with regard to your book is you actually get to things like that. And so I think that that is really a good marker for how different your book is compared to what else is out there it really packages things up quite nicely. So yeah, another, another bit of kudos. But you mentioned a few things there, and maybe we can just talk about them to, to kind of dive in a little bit. You talked about disruption and you talked about non-linearity. And maybe mm -hmm. we could just start there. When we, when we say disruption, you know, what, what do we mean by that? What's different about now? And if we could start there, you also mentioned non-linearity. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Those would be good, good places to start. Yeah, no, for sure. And these are, these are really important topics to, to unpack. And... I've been accused of inventing words and things, um, so <laughs> so maybe I have, and maybe they are not understood or or, or used in that way. So let me um, reframe how we use them. So let's start with disruption. For for probably most of the world, some know Joseph Schumpeter and creative destruction, and kind of take a kind of more institutional macroeconomic. Um, what happens after you know? Second World War, reconstruction, and, and the way society and systems and, mm. and econ economies kind of rebuild, and there's innovation in that, there's destruction, there's, a, there's a sort of um, tensions and contradictions which go with destruction and, and creation. And that for us, we re reference as disruption 1.0. Disruption mm. 2.0 is probably what 98 of, or whatever percent of the world treat as disruption, which is disruptive innovation, which is Clayton Christensen's perspective on disruption, which is going to be probably more focused on organizations, on products, on specific technologies. And the way, you know, we can spend time on it, but it's quite well known. You can define quite clearly in the Clayton Christensen definition of um, disruptive innovation, what are the rules, what incrementally allows you to be defined as disruptive innovation, or what isn't. And they it's recognizable, it's understandable, it's replicable, it's definable, etc. We use disruption, and that for us is disruption 2.0. We use systemic disruption. So when we use disruption, we use systemic disruption. We take it as a term which is effectively constant change, not necessarily positive or negative. The impact can depend on how you view the world, how you prepare for it, and uh, how you respond to it. And that systemic disruption is really has a number of features. One, it's unpredictable. Two is that the ripple effects. So any assumptions you make, any outcomes, you know, don't just stay where they are. It's systemic, so they can compound, they hyperconnected, um, multiple drivers of change. You can't always isolate discrete elements, unlike disruptive innovation, which is specific mm -hmm. companies, specific innovation. And um, they can be inflection points because the trajectory is probably going to be of an exponential nature. So we'll come back to that in a minute. But the nonlinear, oh, we can talk about it now. So effectively, change is slow until it isn't. And so that nonlinearity, that exponentiality, the big implication is really that basically the inputs are amplified or non-proportional to the inputs. So 
it works both ways. You can have very positive things with social media, however bad social media can be. It allows certain voices and change to, to affect and reach a large number of people. It can also be very damaging things. So that idea of nonlinear narrative means that you can't you know, assume that a, a given percentage of risk or a given specific um, element that the outcome is proportional to whatever that that input mm. is. Um, of course, you know this intimately. Just uh, just doing that for your for your listeners and for those who are less familiar with that. And then it links slightly to an element of risk as well as in what one calls super cats. So they rising super catastrophes, the spillovers of events. So you can't just again look at things in isolation, but how they now come. And I think concrete examples of that are, are unfortunately very easy to find on the negative side. You know, whether you're looking at the energy crisis, the Ukraine war, or climate events, it's never just an isolated event. It then translates into food insecurity, energy crisis, human migration, and, and all kinds of things which have significant knock-on effects. Um, and so that idea where there's an mm. increasing cost of relying on assumptions because our world is not linear, stable, predictable, comprehensible, that idea is basically what we talk about as systemic disruption and which we refer to as disruption 3.0. Okay. Yeah, that's a great way to, to start. And uh, there's a lot there's a lot of really good stuff there. You You link this into you, you mentioned this as well flawed assumptions that we make about the world and I, I i suppose it's sort of it's almost human nature to want to put things into boxes so to isolate you know the ukraine war from mm -hmm. the ener you know energy cost inflation climate change these but you you know these things are interconnected and and so have you seen where decision makers aren't able to grasp this and organizations aren't really able to make decisions in a way that really takes into account the nature of disruption 3.0. Yeah, so the the way I look at it, and honestly, it's it's an interesting kind of for me to take my own life as an experience mm. and as kind of you know because for pretty much most of my professional career, I I would not have understood your question. I'd have thought, well, you know. These are world leaders, they're running the best companies. Everybody understands these topics and takes them into account. And it's only when I kind of started understanding foresight and futures thinking, and also some of the things we just talked about, about systemic disruption. And then you start unpacking what organizations, how they're cabled and, and how they're organized. And I think that two things that are happening in terms of, mm. if I understood the question, in terms of how, how or why are organizations not able to kind of have sense-making, decision-making and responses that take into account systemic disruption. And why would that be the case if that is so prevalent? Why wouldn't they? Um, and so I think there are a number of things which are, you know, the assumptions that organizations and mm. people make and the relying on the assumptions. But if we were to die, die sort of sected, I think there are two big factors happening. One is a lack of appreciation of, of, of risk, as simple as that. I think um, you for sure, many of your listeners, but, but will know that risk is effectively, you know the outcomes, you know the variables, you have a sense of the occurrences. So, you know, how likely are you of dying from lung cancer if you're a smoker? How likely are you to have an accident or if you're driving at a certain speed? So, all the potential outcomes are known and the likelihood of occurrence of those assumptions um, are known and measurable. So that's highly predictable, that's mm. fine. And in that context of known knowns or to some degree known unknowns, you can, mm. you're okay with that. A lot of organizations are cabled like that. Now, then there's another debate, even with what one calls risk, where the ones mm. really responding in the right way or not, or whether you sometimes, you know, that's another matter. But generally risk is kind of more manageable. Hmm. Then you have uncertainty. Now uncertainty, you know the future events, but you might not know the occurrence. So that might be, for instance, will China end up being the number one economy in the world? Um, and here the probabilities of the occurrence of each specific event 
are not known. So you might have sort of, you know, the risk is you throw the dice, fine. The uncertainty, you might have one future state, you know, will China be number one, second future state, third future state. And while you might not know precisely the probability or even be able to probabilize each of them, you have a sense of those three future events. Now, with deep uncertainty, which is one notch up from risk, which is uncertainty, and then with one notch up with this uncertainty, you don't even know the future states. So you don't know the events or the occurrences that might arise. You clearly can't probabilize them. You don't even know if they're happening or not. And the stakeholders don't know or can't agree on, on the resolutions or the possibilities of those events themselves. And they are extremely connected to our early discussion around how systemic the world mm. is. And so this is like, you know, what is the extent of the impact of climate changes for sea rising or for the world being submerged? Which parts of the world? By how much? By when? I mean, New York, L.A., is it some a little bit? Is it, you know, just a little mm. flood? Um, will singularity arise? Um, when? What shape? Bio-warfare? Will we live in space? On Mars? And when you add all these, you have absolutely no idea of these possibilities, future outcomes. And that's deep uncertainty. Now, most of our world is more deeply uncertain than that. And so when leadership teams, organizations, to your question, are behaving as if if you don't see the risk, it's not there, yeah. If it's low probability risk, then we're probably okay. It's low probability without thinking about the outcomes and the nonlinear nature of that risk. And when you treat those risks as discrete and isolated, not understanding that not only are these not risks, but it's deeply uncertain. And that's where, so that's the one reason, I think. And then the second reason is really just a question of strategic planning versus foresight of future thinking. Right. Um, and we can unpack that if, if you want. But just. I think that's it. Yeah, I think that'd be a good, good thing to unpack a little bit here because you, you mentioned futures thinking mm -hmm. and it links back to the question about sort of linearity because mm -hmm. I, I see a lot of decision makers making decisions based on a kind of a linear yeah. path. This is what's happened and, and then using strategic planning, which is also based on a kind of a fixed variables, linear assumptions, things, things like that. And you're talking about something that's different and that I'm not sure that a CEO of a FTSE 500 company really understands. So if you could just talk about that, I think it'd be a good time to talk about features thinking versus strategic planning. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about that. And before doing so, but it will give the, the right framing. Um, I'm going to um, refer to, to, of course, what, what you and many of your listeners will know, but, but just for those who don't, and just to frame it um, in context, the Dave Snowden's Kinovan framework. And it's that distinction between complicated, where you can have known unknowns, you can rely on experts, um, you can understand exactly the, um, the outcomes of, of change, um, you can, um, it's, it's linear, it's more controllable. And in that context, you understand how to send, however complicated it may be, a probe to Mars. You understand how to uh, build rocket launchers. You understand how to, you know, where to draw what you require for, for whatever exploration, etc. So that's kind of, you can rely on science, the unknown unknowns, and etc. The consideration is that a lot of our world is complex and linked to our, our framing of systemic disruption. If we take the language and the parameters, if the only one talks about complexity, but I, I really like Dave Snowden's um, kind of in framework. And the distinction with what we just described of complicated is, is complex. So complex, what's different? Mm. It's nonlinear instead of linear. So the outcomes can be disproportionate. You don't necessarily know beforehand ex ante what the outcomes might be of a specific course of action. So it's emergent. You need to a degree trial and error and emergence to then discover how that evolves. You then need to know how to either amplify or reduce certain actions as to seeing where they bring. There are multiple drivers of changes and possibilities and not just one. So that's going to be, for instance, um, the Amazon River. If you move the river slightly or build a resort, mm -hmm. what are all the impacts of that 
they are not easy to simulate. It's not the same as, you know, however complicated it might be, how you send a probe to Mars. Mm -hmm. And so that complex environment is the one we, we live in, which has the features of what we call systemic disruption. Now, what does that mean for strategic planning versus futures thinking? Often a strategic plan will, first of all, be thinking shorter term horizons than, long, than futures thinking. That means probably the next few months, the next quarters, two, three years. Now, with exponentiality and with certain drivers of change, and when you think about the next order implications, they may not materialize within that time frame. Of course, it's not an accident. Incentives determine outcomes, as Munger says. So if the governance structures, the leadership teams, the terms of uh, leadership, the duration, the incentives are built in a certain way, people will focus on specific timing, mm -hmm. which is shorter. They often focus on milestones, a strategic plan, mm. instead of thinking about an emergent behavior. You're looking for the answer because you're constantly thinking, let's get a specialist, let's get someone with experience, um, there must be an answer. Great if you're in a complicated environment and they're unknown knowns. Mm. If they are unknown unknowns and it's emergent and there are not necessarily any right answers beforehand, well, you should maybe be asking questions instead of seeking answers. Question. Mm. Sorry, you should be speaking, looking for questions to mm. ask yourself as to why, why not, what right. if, what if not, so what, right. as opposed to finding answers. You're going to behave in a strategic plan as if you have that comfort that the world is controllable, linear, that mm. it's stable, that it's contained, as opposed to systemic, non-linear, complex with spillovers. You're going to be able to think that you can model uncertainties. The reality is that it's not by modelizing something or you can model mm. any, uh, every single piece of data in the world. You don't get rid of uncertainties because you modelize them. The strategic plan is looking at a strategic plan often or variation of it or plan B or plan C, but you're not looking in earnest at multiple futures, multiple possibilities. You're having a deterministic view on the world. If I do A, B will happen, as opposed to thinking about indeterminacy and what that means for decision making. And you're constantly just analyzing data, processing it, absorbing the noise in it, instead of picking up early signals or things which may have less data or, or really making that distinction mm. between, between noise and that. And so that's really for strategic planning, focusing on predictions and assumptions and relying on those assumptions, as opposed to thinking about accepting uncertainty and the plurality of the world. So foresight and futures thinking is really that. Its origin is, you know, in the 1970s with Herman Kahn and, and the Rand Corporation on the kind of more institutional side, when the world realized after World War II that the end of the world was a possibility, that you need to build in things which might seem unimaginable, they started devising sort of scenario development. And then you have people like Pierre Wack, oddly enough, which helped um, in the 70s for business strategy, who started mm. thinking about maybe we need many scenarios to think about broadly the thing. And that is really, maybe that's the last comment on this, is really not to seek to predict, despite mm. misnomer or whatever, futurist or foresight strategy or scenario development, the idea is not to predict. It actually doesn't matter if what you kind of imagine is correct. What matters is that you're imagining a broad set of possibilities. You're building that muscle of resiliency, of adaptability, of accustomed to change and to uncertainty and to decision making. And so you're scrutinizing both the opportunities and the risks of things that may not be as kind of vanilla. And also the possible consequences, again, both positive and negative, of the outcomes, not, you know, and in nonlinear, the outcomes are not necessarily proportional. And so all of that helps you basically better prepare for the unexpected. You can't sort of say, oh, I didn't expect it. It wasn't, you know, your job is to think about the unexpected. And so anticipating certain possibilities will mean better preparation. You'll have a broader view of the world, which gives you that anticipatory decision making and governance that will inform decision making today. So, again, another misnomer is that if you're thinking long term, it's to make a decision in 10 years time. No, all of that is actually informing your decision making today around building resiliency and futures intelligence. And for those things you can't predict or don't predict, because, again, we're not looking at prediction per se, you're looking at better preparation, you're going to be 
better able to respond as and when things arrive by virtue of having built more resiliency into into structures, systems, etc. Mm -hmm. That's a great summary. And I like one of the quotes that you have in the, the book. I, I can't remember where it was, but it was the one from Ernest Hemingway. It was from The Sun Also Rises. How did you go bankrupt two ways gradually then suddenly? And the it, it strikes me that a lot of leaders are really operating under that kind of worldview that if you focus on the short term and not thinking in terms of alternative futures, then the gradual may become sudden. And maybe that's, you know, we can talk a little bit about maybe it's that's, you know, a, a feature, not a bug. Maybe it's the, 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 you talk about incentives, maybe everything's sort of designed for short termism. But um, mm -hmm. but anyway, it, it it's a very useful way of looking at the world. And it reminds me of a quote that you know the future is the future is plural right the future it's futures yeah no one no one really knows and it's kind of a fool's errand to try to predict that's really useful and um i'm wondering if we could also just touch on you you, you mentioned that the, the constancy of disruption that mm -hmm. you know the and, and it feels like we're at a time historically where we've had the Russia-Ukraine war, COVID, mm -hmm. uh, before that in the US, there was Trump, and we've had Brexit here in the UK, and so many, so many things that, you know, it should appear by now that these are all, this is just the world in which we live, right? That mm -hmm. there'll be another thing, and it will look probably different from the, the last thing. And we should just be accepting of you know just sort of letting go of this sort of linear world yeah so it's it's very important what you've just said on on so many different levels and it it ties in very much maybe it's not an accident we're having this discussion today um with with our own thinking and it's really not that the world has necessarily changed and it's not necessarily that it's a problem the way the world is. I mean, the world is the way it is. <laughs> you know, you yeah. Feel free to challenge it. It's kind of mm. not necessarily going to flinch or adapt to your mm. worldview. Maybe your view of the world needs to change, and maybe mm. that's easier to fix, although debatable, than, than the world itself. Yeah. Um, and so there are a few, a few thoughts around this. I think, first of all, I personally don't think it matters that the world is the way it is. Actually, first of all, it's just the way it is, you know, there's no matter or not matter or whatever. I think the issue is when the governance structures, the leadership, the incentives, the education systems are not acknowledging the nature of the world as we described mm. it, are not allowing you to, to give mm. you the tools to make sense of what that world is and how to respond to it. I think that that is really the challenge. And sometimes one understands full well the nature of the world and what it is, but just the incentives make you ignore it. So there are different levels. I think if you're in good faith and you're brought up and you go to school, our educational systems are not focusing on these things. They're focusing on how better to answer questions for which we already know the answers, mm. the kind of known knowns or the known unknowns. So the educational systems aren't kind of allowing you to think about all that. And then a lot of the governance structures are intentionally focusing on what's easier, which is next few quarters, measure it and forget the rest. And so there's a lot of disconnect around that. Now, two things I just want to add, because it's it's really an important observation, this change is a constant, effectively, is what you're saying, and that's just the word the world is. Um, if you take Eastern philosophy, I know we, we talked about it and exchanged on it, it's actually the way Eastern philosophy considers a lot of the world. Um, the idea of mujo, impermanence, the world being transient, is is something which, you know, even the Greeks, Heraclitus, you never put mm. your foot in the same world mm. twice, you know, because you change, your foot changes, the water changes, etc. This, the idea of wabi-sabi, you know, this idea of acceptance of transience and imperfection. Shoshin, beginner's mind, you know, you don't just look at the experience you have or what you learned or what experts mm. say. Again, not, not being dismissive of science. Science is absolutely fantastic and, and amazing, 
when it can be applied directly and have all the answers. At other times, it's still emergent, however scientific and robust and important. Yeah. They may not be the only answers. If I just may stop you there, because the, it's one of the things that I, we, I've had uh, conversations on this program mm -hmm. around as well, in that I don't think that science is antithetical to what you've just talked about, because I think there's an important part of science, sometimes we forget, the scientific method and that's the formulation of a hypothesis and where does that come yeah. from and that requires creativity and lots of lots of things that make us inherently human and how do you find that hypo hypothesis before you test yeah. and it's not just a rigid thing so all of this is very you know to me it it meshes very well with the scientific method is yeah. we sometimes forget that um, we when we talk about science we <laughs> we often talk about proven you know, sort of proven yeah. science as opposed to the entirety of the scientific method, which of course, you know, most of us aren't involved in formulating and testing hypotheses of like whether or not the universe exists and, you know, all these, all these kinds of things, but it's really important to, uh, to, to yeah. bear that in mind. It, Sorry. I thought, I thought uh, I'd latch on to no, that. No, it's so amazing that you raise this because a few years ago, I've never even have thought about justifying or explaining because there's no such thing as kind of the scrutiny of anti-science or conspiracy or whatever, mm -hmm. or it wasn't at scale, let's say. Mm -hmm. And it's only more recently that I kind of find myself having to, to kind of think about it. But you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, it goes without saying. And it's, it's all to do with the difference between complicated and complex. When it's complicated and you have unknown unknowns and you have known unknowns and known knowns and that you can use science and it's, it's already proven and you have the answer and you know how to produce mm -hmm. whatever vaccine or how to whatever. And indeed, it's it's the emergent nature of life, of discovery, of scientific discovery included, et cetera, which means that one can't just rely entirely today on certain aspects when the unknown unknowns. But it has a, the role, you, what you've described is actually essential as part of that emergent discovery process and that scientific discovery. Mm -hmm. So 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 that's that's essential. And if you take the projection you know, and think about just life more generally. And, you know, we can unpack it later if you want. But from an existential philosophy perspective, if you didn't have um, uncertainty and unpredictability, life would be pretty, pretty dull. And, and it, I mean, I'm not just saying that in jest. I mean, even just philosophically and existentially, it would mean that your life is predetermined. Mm. So what allows you to have agency, freedom and choice, whether it's for whatever emergent things, is precisely because you don't have predictability. Yeah, it's a it's sort of a Zen Cohen. It's a it's a bit of a mind fuck, if you like, because it's if we knew everything, then everything would exist. There would be nothing to discover. And it's almost like I, I use this in the context of, of, of context of discussing I'm not a startup person, but uh -huh. you know, the startup world is sort of lots of startups fail, but there would be no startup ecosystem unless the if the thing all the things existed but of course all the things don't exist so you know if you're looking at founding a startup a thing doesn't really exist in the world well it's that's precisely the point and it's just this sort of um anyway it's a it's a bit of a, a zen cone but you're right it, it kind of is the in many ways it's the fuel of, of what gives life to uh to human endeavor or what gives energy to human endeavor because mm -hmm. we don't know everything Anyway, a little bit of a tangent. No, no, but it's, it's, yeah. it's related. Yeah. This may sound like a bit of an esoteric kind of conversation to some listeners, but and I would like to take this to a to an individual level. But for let's say for organizations, if if there are some things, and you you have a little bit of a framework here, if there if there are a few things to do differently, what would you advise? How mm -hmm. how does one thrive in this environment? If you could just talk, maybe you have a, you have this sort of high level framework that uh, is triple. You call it triple A, or uh, mm -hmm. wh however however you describe that. Or maybe mm -hmm. there's maybe you want to take this somewhere else for someone who's listening up until now, and they say, "Well, this is all interesting, but it sounds all very theoretical." What what should my organization do? What should I do? What are some practical things that I can start doing and thinking about? Yeah, no, no, for sure. So we do have a framework which we put an acronym yeah. on, and um, 
we're not the only ones and you know not not necessarily just trying to, to be marketing but the the idea is the following the idea is that and you know again to our earlier discussion around the origin story a lot of publications or peers or thought leaders or what have you uh, can be quite focused on a specific, you know, mm. this is the future thinking method and this is anti-fragility. And, you know, mm. so we went quite broad and we thought, well, what are the ingredients to basically making sense of responding best and decision making in the context we described? And we feel it's it's basically three three key ingredients, which is anticipatory. So that's really the future thinking we described earlier as opposed to just strategic planning. And that is, at its most simple, it's really imagining the unimaginable, including a broad set of possibilities, including some which we might not fathom or understand. Mm -hmm. So that's- And, and by, by the way, before, mm -hmm. it, sorry to interrupt, but sure. for listeners out there, that, that there are methods to doing this. Like there's, this is not, this has been around for, for a while, right? Sure. And the, the, you know, the method that you mentioned pure whack and everything and the idea isn't as you say it's not to predict but you could outline a, a few couple of extreme futures that would be very you know relevant to one's organization that um that one can look at and then use to start making some decisions and do a little bit of planning now so, so sorry i didn't mean to no no for sure there, you're no, no, you're right, because it's not a well-known um, well kind of uh, mm. subject matter. So not only are there methods, it's, it's at least, you know, you can go in a structured way at least half a century and, and more if you take it in a, in a broader sense. You can study it at a master's level, you can study it at a PhD level. Um, so foresight mm. strategy and futures thinking is, mm -hmm. um, is a real field with a lot of, you know, work done on it, and a lot of very incredible um, books and people, and um, we touch upon it in a, in a meaningful way in our work as well on that. So that's that's really foresight strategy being anticipatory. So thinking about the future, so it's longer time frames, broader, deeper, and think about the next order implications, and then thinking about how that informs decision making today. So that's mm -hmm. one element of the AAA. Anticipatory. The next one is again borrowed from um, Nassim Taleb, which is anti fragility. And we mm -hmm. kind of sort of consider that anti fragile are foundations that, that you need to have to build not only resiliency, but actually to, to benefit from the shock. So, what are some of the features of, of anti fragility and what I think are some of the most important ones? So, one is what we touched upon early on, which is um, acknowledging the nonlinear nature of the world. And for Nassim Taleb, he calls this kind of fat tails and really it's an asymmetric relationship between if a shock arises, what is the outcome of that shock? So you're anti-fragile if you get more upside than downside from a particular shock. And so you need to be very resilient to be anti-fragile. So resiliency is a prerequisite for anti-fragility. You're fragile if from a shock, the outcomes are amplified. So, so let's just give a very concrete example. Let's think about an organization, maybe a financial institution, which um, made certain assumptions around risk management and about the probability of interest rates going up and who said, okay, there's only a whatever percentage chance of the inf interest rates going up. And they did their models and they made mm -hmm. all the assumptions we've talked about earlier. And suddenly the interest rates go up a little bit more in an asymmetrical way. Well, guess what? Silicon Valley Bank, within 24 hours, it was pretty much out of business. So this is what we're talking about with fat tails, to use Nassim Taleb or, or anti-fragile. And then there are many other things we can unpack, mm -hmm. but a lot of it is to do with assumptions, with linearity, yeah with what we've talked about. So have anti-fragile foundations versus fragile, think in longer time frames, And then the point is that you need the agility to reconcile the longer term vision with today. So our third A is agility to zoom in and zoom out between longer time frames, because ultimately only the present exists. And so you need to discover how to emerge, how mm. to go through trial and error, how to have the diverse perspectives of discovery process, whether it's scientific or strategic or emergent or whatever it is, you need that emergent and strategic agility. So our triple A is think long-term, have anti-fragile foundations and have the agility to emerge today 
in an environment where you don't have all the answers, where they are unknown unknowns. And that's okay. that's it. I might might yeah. add actually two enablers to the AAA, which we think are quite important. Yes. They're more kind of um, catalysts as opposed to the foundations of the framework, which is alignment. Hmm. If you don't have some kind of alignment, it's going to be difficult to get people to to, hmm. to buy in. Um, and that doesn't mean just yes, yes, people. There are many ways of of having a discussion which is not aligned. But yeah. Ultimately, you need some form of alignment. And the other one is agency. If you have the most amazing framework and all that in the mm. world, but no one is doing anything about it, that lack of agency is really not going to be very helpful, yeah. however good your framework. So that's really it. Okay, that's great. So uh, where I'd like to maybe go next is to talk a little bit about how you or the parts, the volume three of the guide around your life, right? So the individuals and how you, you talk about things like updating and disrupting oneself and, and just, we're all, I think we all are suffering from dealing with all the constant change, some more than others. Some are really thriving, but I, if you, if one looks at what's happening in the, you know, in the, in the news with things like, mental health uh, due to social media or, or younger generations that are really in a, uh, perhaps a tougher place economically than their uh, parents were. Just some examples of some indicators that seem to suggest that individually we've got all this stuff going on. And let's not forget that our brains are really quite primitive compared to the technology that we are using and dealing with every day. So if you could maybe walk through that sort of section of the of the guide a little bit, I think that would be quite helpful. And then maybe we can take it from there and maybe either zoom out or talk a little bit about AI and, and things like that. But um, I think that would be a good place to uh, spend a bit of time. No, thanks for, for raising that. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, society, humanity is composed of, of of individuals and so if we don't bring things back not just to the human level but to the individual level none of what we've talked about kind of helps so again one of the reasons why we we took comfort or or whatever or naivety and calling it the different guide is that in looking at all this we needed to think about the individual so volume three is called beta your life existence in a disruptive world now don't get me wrong, we're not taking lightly on the theme thriving disruption, that it's all great, that mm. all the technology disruption is fantastic, that everybody's doing great, etc. No, we, we don't use disruption in the sense, as, yeah. as I said, <clears throat> that, that it's the great startup messing mm. everything up. We, we consider it just to be a description of the nature of the world. So the world is what it is, and our ability to completely change the way the world is, is, is limited. So therefore, what we focus on is... What are those ingredients which can help us at an individual level maybe get more comfortable with it? And so there are a number of things to, to unpack and just kind of thinking of structuring it and also in the interest of time, what, what's best. So I think one element is really just coming back to the existential side. Again, don't mean to be too philosophical about it, but concretely, if life um, was completely predictable, you would not have any freedom, agency, or choice. So mm. disruption is is just change. It's change as a constant. There's some Eastern philosophies and Buddhism which accept that transience mm. and that constant change. And so one of the things we're just trying to highlight in that particular volume, and it's, an, it's, a, it's a theme throughout, is that the way we see the world is not the way necessarily the world is. So helping people just kind of have a broader mm. sense of the world. By doing so, there's some things that we as individuals can't control. There's some things that we can. We can't control necessarily incentive systems or governance systems throughout. We can't necessarily change the educational system per se. But if a parent is reading that or if you're reading that, you can maybe choose what micro learning, including what is free, you can do about it. You know, today, a young girl in, in the south of India probably has as much information as a Harvard professor with a 30 you know, dollar smartphone. So not saying it's easy if you're not brought in the right environment, but there are 
democratization and barriers that are kind of play both ways if you kind of know how to harness it. So the big idea of, of volume three is you can't rely on what you're being taught at school because they're not looking at the world as they should. You can't rely necessarily on what your environment or your teachers or your friends and family are guiding you. You can't rely just on your experience or the visibility you have, if you're, especially if you're assuming that things will just continue as they are. So what does that mean? It means looking at the world a bit differently. It means develop, developing different type of, of optionality, planting different seeds, following different interests. It means harnessing the fact that if you went to the best school, maybe you won't be have a perfect life from a professional mm. or whatever perspective or career. And if you went to the worst school or didn't go to school at all, it maybe doesn't have an mm. effect. So that, that unpredictability and uncertainty is actually something you can, you can harness in different ways. And we then bring in elements of context about what's happening in work, what's happening with technology, what's happening um, with things like longevity, transhumanism, things which are drivers of change, which will affect the individual directly. Our idea with volume three, as with the whole work, is really that awareness is probably a prerequisite to action and enable agency. So unless you're aware of certain things, and that's why we try and communicate this and have a mm -hmm. volume on individuals and have social media and that, unless you're aware of this, you're probably not going to action anything. You're probably going to just deal with, with things in certain ways. Now, of course, we realize that much of the world is struggling to just you know go to school or survive or have freedom. Um, so we're cognizant of that. So we could be accused, and that, that's fine, that... It doesn't cover every single individual in the world. But I would say that for probably billions of people who have some degree of agency and choices and decisions they make every day, in our humble opinion, we feel that being more aware of these things could alter the way they look at the world and prepare for it than if they didn't, despite a lot of the everyday constraints for a lot of the world. And you hear stories every day from every part of the world from some of the harshest conditions. So we feel that there's a kind of magnet, you know, amplifier effect. If more people were aware of that, it would be less maybe of the exception that people are taking different paths. Mm -hmm. They would kind of realize that maybe taking a different path is actually survival in today's world. Relying on just the kind of cookie cutter mm -hmm. or playbook or whatever kind of experience or or, or syst educational system one has is not so it's really just kind of unpacking that as best we can we try to lower barriers to entry than some technical books i'm not saying it's perfect it's you know it's still difficult to read but it's all relative degrees of difficulty we're not trying to be dogmatic or technical we're trying to give a lot of practical examples and also provide a lot of resources if people want to learn more mm. maybe it leads them to a movie a ted talk that's mm doing a much better job than our 200 pages on whatever topic. So it's really just putting all that together, but focusing on individuals' agency. Yeah, it's a very, uh, there's also that Buddhist thing about attachment, right? That I think we get very yeah. attached to the past or uh, a certain future or a, a certain thing. I think a lot of the drivers for some of the divisiveness we've seen in the world uh, have to do with attachment to maybe a, a past that didn't even really exist. Um, speaking yeah. here, yeah. I'm thinking more about Brexit as my um, reference point being uh, here in the UK. Uh, there's a, yeah, it's hard. I mean, there's a bit of a, of a letting go, but also of embracing uncertainty. And I think more skills that you know, that people have to to do that, the the more that one's going to uh, going to thrive. Um, so you, I think you do a good job of bringing some of these things up to the up to the surface. Just in the interest of time, I would like to dive into AI. Mm -hmm. So you have a, a chapter on AI, and this is something that's very topical right now. It's growingly important, and you have a very interesting, I think, take on. On it, and first of all, I think you, you've mentioned it, but just around you talk about the, you know, the way the world is. I think you have a similar take on technology: is that technology is neither necessarily good nor bad, but you know it can be it can be both. And I I saw that coming through in your section on AI. But I'm just wondering if you could explain a little bit the approach that you take in the book about AI and how to think about that. 
Yeah, so it's a, it's a big topic. So again, just thinking about how, how to kind of... There, there are a few things. I think one element which is important is to, is to kind of think about coming back to the exponentiality and inflection points. What are the AI inflection points and why is it kind of changes slow mm-hmm. until it isn't? And we kind of call that the inflection paradox, which is the paradox between the exponentiality where at the beginning you don't notice it and then it's too late, you know, to right. the Hemingway um, quote, yeah. changes, you know, um, how did you get Paul gradually then suddenly. Um, but the other important thing that plays against that is really um, Amara's law, which is you tend to kind of overestimate and overhype innovations or technologies early on and sometimes underestimate the impact longer term. But the combination of the two means you miss things. So what do I mean by that? If you take you know, the metaverse or AI, the real changes were slow and not noticeable and it became you know, a bit exponential. And then you're kind of dismissing some of the hype things about AI, oh, it's not intelligent, it's not this or whatever. And those put together means you kind of suddenly wake up and the LLMs and all that, and you're like, oh, okay. But if you kind of think about the signals, the huge progress with both image and language a few years ago were an inflection point for AI. And we miss it because of of that inflection paradox. Now, that's point number one. Point number two, the special nature of AI, which is why we treat it differently from technology, is that it's the next battleground for decision making. In other words, it's really a way of of decision making being made autonomously, potentially at scale, and the impact of humanity on that. And we're not just talking about you know the discrimination, which we know about, and many fantastic books written about. We're not just talking about you know algorithms determining your mortgage and that. We're literally talking about the fact that hu- decision making was almost humans' exclusivity for a lot of the history, and that today our existence is in existence in the technological world. So we have to look at both our existential and technological condition. Within that, we don't have exclusivity on decision making. And so if that AI is determining outcomes on our behalf, then basically it's suddenly reducing our agency. Now, and then there's a piece around the AI race and supernationals, and that's another topic. But if we come back to the individual, which for me is really the, the most important thing, if we then add to everything else we've talked about around systemic change, around machines learning for fast, and machine learning and processing power and costing less and less and all the sort of drivers of technological change, basically machines are continuing to learn fast. Now, today in a complex world, again, if you take the complex versus complicated dichotomy, machines should not be good at complex either because you can't establish Mm. the outcomes ex ante. It's nonlinear, so the correlations and all that Mm. may be of no use, et cetera. But it is emergent because machine learning is, is emergent. And so the way we unpack it is that the most important thing with AI is really the human agency. Coming back to the topic of volume three and our key theme, the human agency. What as humans are we doing to understand the nature of the complex world, to understand how we make decisions in uncertainty and unpredictability, Mm. to upgrade our educational systems and governance systems so that we are better able to understand and make decisions in complexity? If we don't, we're basically having to delegate our decision-making authority to machines because we're no longer as comfortable or able Mm. because the world is too complex. So don't get me wrong. We're not saying ethics isn't key. We're not saying the writing's on the wall, AI will become whatever. We're Mm. just suggesting that with, of course, the right debates and, and initiatives around ethics and everything, the debate around only will computers be super intelligence? When will singularity happen? What is the date? Is a dangerous debate because it's mm. pushing aside what should we as humans be doing to remain relevant in light of whatever's happening around technology and AI. And so I see a lot of people, even people I respect, 
who are you know critiquing the the Hararis and all the scaremongering around AI, saying no, they don't, they're just machines. We're more intelligent. We have mm-hmm. agency and all that. Yeah, we do today, and we have a ledge on computers. But what are we doing with computers that are learning fast to maintain that edge? What are we doing to adapt? And so it, it boils down, long story short, it boils down for me to what we call tech essentialism, which is technology and existentialism, which is that in the 21st century, if we're de-skilling ourselves and delegating decision making, we're reducing and maybe annihilating our agency, freedom, and choice because we're no longer capable and as able mm. around AI. And so I think that in addition to all the debates and initiatives and legislations that are required, I see almost no debate, initiatives, regulations to change educational systems, to change the way we think about the world, the, to, mm. to integrate all the things we've been talking about which basically will allow, in my humble opinion, humans to more likely remain relevant as machines continue to learn fast than if we don't upgrade ourselves in the organic way. I'm talking about critical thinking. I'm talking Mm. about things which our educational systems, the way we're cabled, aren't kind of perfect. And so I'm just a little bit concerned with, you know, there's no shortage of debates by the brightest minds, but I'm not seeing huge focus on that topic of human agency and and the changes required for society and educational systems. And when there is a debate, I'm not seeing any kind of action around it. And these are not either ors. It's not instead of ethics. It's not instead of other regulation. It's, it's, It's in addition to realizing that that is the thing that we probably have the most ability to shape how we view the world, prepare for it, and respond in the context of what's happening to AI. Hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting. You you reference a piece of research around the, uh, the David Deming, the growing importance of decision making on the job in that in that section yeah. in that right, um, yeah. which I kind of latched on to um, mm-hmm. because the, the the ability to work with AI as humans is I think quite essential, and I I do think and I do see a lot of shortcomings in how humans make decisions in organizations. And, um, and I think it's a very relevant, relevant point. Is that what you're referring to with regard to the educational system and teaching skills, such as thinking critically and being able to work with technology in a collaborative way, or is, are you, was there another reason why you included a reference to decision-making? No, I think it's it's all of the above, right? It depends on what what point you are at in life. I think when you're you're kind of younger, it's it's thinking about models like maybe Israel, like Finland, like why are those countries more innovative? Why mm. you know what's different in the educational system? You know, why is Israel have more patents per habitat habitant or more breakthrough R and D than any other country in the world. What's different in terms of the way they're cabled? What's different in terms of the educational systems? And mm. one thing you notice, there's a different line between military and and civil in Israel. And one thing you notice is that you know, however good the Stanford's and all that are in the world, they're still focusing on on becoming even better at mastering the things we know. Okay. Um, and answering better questions which are articulated and which have known answers. Okay. Um, how much is focused on completely unknown, never seen mm. before, etc. How can a tiny country with less than 10 million people like Israel um, in the early 90s realize that cyber was an existential risk and become the world leader in a technology that didn't even exist, that's changing every day, mm. that needed to be defined and give... 16, 18, 20 year old kids, the ability to, to kind of be tuned into that and to develop that industry better than anybody else in the world. What, what are those agree ingredients? And so it comes back to the complicated versus complex. A lot of the educational systems are focusing on known knowns, known unknowns, developing expertise, specialists. Not only are they siloed, but they're also specialists, not necessarily connecting the dots with other things. 
What and are then some if you think yep, sorry. of the complex, yep. then that's that's not necessarily being done. And so the complex is the educational system, which is whether it's decision making or sense making or critical okay. thinking or whatever it is, that where there are unknown unknowns. Sorry, but I didn't mean Okay, to no, I was just gonna dive in and, and just ask what are the things that educational systems should be focused on, which you just mentioned right right there. Yeah. So listen, again, I'm I'm not an educator per se, although I guess I am mm. in a sense, but, you know, spoke to probably a hundred plus people all over the world. We had very different perspectives from the Minerva school in San Francisco, different models, Finland, Israel, all kinds of different countries and why some of the best schools in the world, like Singapore, have, they might have the best mathematicians in the world, but why they don't have the kind of edge in terms of innovation and that. And so there are a number of things. I think one is, is really just understanding the world as it is. So what we just described, not, relying on assumptions, not relying just on expertise, etc. Number two, and that's linked to critical thinking. So it's, it's critical thinking, unpacking assumptions. People love to hate Elon Musk, but uh, I have no view other than I'm a fellow <laughs> South African. But it's interesting how, you know, you had Airbus and Boeing who were producing um, launchers for, for a certain price, which meant that they weren't commercially viable at scale. You know, what is critical thinking that allows you to realize that actually the cost of building a rocket is only 5% of the total cost that Boeing and they must do it. And it's not because they were cheating the DOD or anything. It's just simply because that's what they've always done. Those are the experts they relied on. When you kill all the assumptions and when you take a blank page and when you apply Shoshin beginner's mind, what does that look like? And that muscle of it's the difference between innovation and invention, right? Instead of incrementally improvements, instead of building on knowledge, it's when things don't exist, when things are impossible, when they're unknown unknowns. That's what you need for complexity because they're unknown unknowns, because climate, because our societal challenges, because technology are situations which are unprecedented. And so if all we're building is the capabilities to incrementally think better, answer better known questions, we don't have the inspiration, the imagination, the improvisation, the mindset of achieving the impossible that goes with that. And then you have things with trial and error and failure. You know, talk about risk management, it's your expertise. You know, what happens in the US if you're worried that your, your kid falls and cuts his finger, that he's going to be sued by the school, by the playground, by the planet, mm. because he cut his finger, versus in Israel where, you know, 10 kids will go to a junkyard, break their leg, build stuff, fall, um, and do all kinds of random stuff. It's that difference between trial and error, experimentation, emergence. And it comes back to, because that is our context, that is where we need to make sense, decide and respond to, to events. That is the challenges we have are complex, they're deeply uncertain. And so somehow it closes the loop. I'm gonna make a final comment on that. Your question I think was, what does education need to be? And hopefully I've touched upon some of those things. The one final comment I wanna make is just for those listeners who are less versed in, in systems thinking and how do you actually affect change in these complex systems we're describing, Worldviews, assumptions, and education is the highest lever for change. It's stronger than incentives or structures or regulation. So coming back to our starting point, which is what is our environment? What is the world? How do we resolve our most complex problems? Unless we address our worldviews and our assumptions and education systems, we're missing out on the biggest and strongest lever for change. Some change is ineffective and even effective change, not all change has equal impact. And so when you think about all that, you can see how what might seem like a bit of an esoteric or whatever topic goes down to the fundamentals of how, why are we in the predicament we are as a society and, and what do we do to, to think about resolving these complex changes? Are we creative enough and able to problem solve ourselves from some of mm. these complex problems. That's a very good point. You mentioned sense making as well there. I'm just, just wondering if you could just quickly explain what you mean by sense making for my listeners as well. Yeah, it's a word which again, you know, people like Dave Snowden unpack in a, in a 
very very detailed way in the in the Kinevan framework and that. But we use it as much as in that way as in just what one could imagine it means. So you have novel situations because of the unpredictability and nonlinearity of the world. You're constantly or more often than not having situations which are new, for which you don't necessarily have a set of, of answers or playbook to follow. So you can't rely as much on expertise or, or on experience. And therefore there's a requirement to make sense of your, of what that environment is. Even if it was complicated and you could rely on a playbook, you still need to make sense to say, oh, this does seem to have the criteria mm -hmm. and the features where I can just simply follow the playbook. Because it's not as if you can't rely on, on many situations of science and experience and, and playbooks. But at least by making sense of your environment, you'll maybe be able to filter whether you're in an environment where certain playbooks mm -hmm. or experiences or expertise can help or whether there's some that are more emergent. I think the danger is when you're chucking a playbook to something completely new and guess what? Mm. Yeah. It's yeah. the wrong playbook. And, and that yeah. happens, you know, all the time, every day, mm. even with inflation, mm. with Yellen, we thought we could control inflation. We thought we had it. We thought this, that's mm. fine. And that's a good playbook in a linear, predictable, controllable world. And I'm sorry, but the best economists in the most advanced or one of the most advanced industries and countries in the world basically had absolutely no idea where inflation was going, no idea where it would go, no idea how to rose there, no idea how to predict it, no idea how to control it. Mm. But they used a playbook which assumed that they had full control of it, understood it, yeah. and whatever came yeah. out of the model was correct. So it's important, that sense-making, to know that maybe we're in an environment where there may be situations other than the one we expect, mm. and therefore we can't just throw a playbook assuming 100% on a particular outcome. Yeah, it comes back to critical thinking and having a bit of a of a your kind of radar to uh, to uncertainty and just being able to ask, you know, why why do we do things this way? Why do we have why do we have this this where did this playbook come from? And yeah. maybe you realize it's a playbook for I don't know American football, but now playing. Soccer. Well, real football. <laughs> yeah, soccer. Yeah, real football. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Exactly. Uh, mm. Yeah. Good stuff. I am just conscious of time, but I did also just want to touch on climate change and the climate, you know, some of our challenges associated with, with climate. And you have a section on it. You have a chapter, I believe, on it. And mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you could maybe provide a few thoughts around how would what we just talked about apply to to climate change sure so big topic we'll try and kind of give two two three points um of application so i think the first one is that idea of tipping points inflection points critical mass mm. right and they work both ways we talk a lot about the tipping points in terms of planetary and irreversibility and, and the dangers mm. but they also work for watershed moments where we can reverse the way organizations do things or industries operate, et cetera. So take, you know, the number of factors which are leading to phase out um, gasoline cars, that's kind of tipping point for, for the positive. So I think the first one is to kind of think about those areas, especially when they kind of positive action that can help the energy mm -hmm. transition around tipping points. The second key aspect, I think, in relation to what we've discussed is that distinction between point solutions, incremental mm. versus transformative innovation. And transformative innovation, you can only really have if you take a systems approach. And so for us, the four elements around transformative innovation versus point solutions and point solutions, it's the latest app or some technology that kind of right. works, but scale or doesn't integrate with doesn't really you know, drive mm. the change in our integrated in our complex. You know. So the, the elements which I think support um, transformative innovation, one is to harness the virtuous inflection points we talked about. So different drivers to that. It's never going to be just one thing, but it can be a combination of regulation, new technology, um, changing consumer habits, although the owners shouldn't be on consumers, but it can be the, the virtuous inflection point of the result of other initiatives, which, which mean that you adopt things differently. The second thing is 
you know, um, to avoid those point solutions and therefore, you know, from a maybe startup or technology perspective, not relying just on technology, mm -hmm. but I think at the stage it's clear that you can't just rely on one thing and exclude technology yeah. from the equation of, of, of possible solutions is to avoid what we call the commercialization value of death. Well, actually, it's not our term, but which is, you know, a lot of things work in isolation or not at scale or not integrated to the rest. And, you know, normally the value of death for startup or new technology is, you know, you don't receive funding or you don't prove it. I think the challenge with climate is that you can have all the funding in the world, you can have mm -hmm. something that's proven in, in a controlled environment, but because of the features we discussed earlier, it's kind of more difficult to, to scale. So that's, that's the second point, to, to avoid the commercialization value of death. The third point is to drive effective systemic change. So really focusing on the whole value chain of the drivers of change. So it's not just regulation or just technology, mm -hmm. it includes our earlier discussion, education and assumption of worldview is actually the highest lever for change. Yeah. And the fourth, fourth one is building resiliency, understanding that you, you know, you need resiliency in the systems. And so that means many different things for it's not the same for country or city or for an operator of hotels or for one's individual life, but how to build resiliency. And you know, I work with a company that focuses on futures intelligence called Service. And sorry, that focuses on climate intelligence. And me, climate intelligence gives a very practical dashboard, unpacking what are the possible eventualities depending mm. on your asset base or your footprint for these uncertain longer term events, but for which you need to make maybe certain decisions, investments or capex today. So those point solutions versus transformative innovation, it's really inflection points, commercialization value of death, understanding and appreciating the levers of change in systemic worlds and then building resiliency. And I think, you know, I mean, there's no quick fix. These are very complex problems, mm. but at least acknowledging that and addressing that. So obviously a press release saying I'm doing whatever and greenwashing or whatever doesn't fall with anything mm. effective. It's evident because simply those are surface events. So if you look at the levers for change, surface events do not really change anything. Mm. Or if it was just SEC legislation, it would be, you know, transparency and disclosure and feedback loops, they'd be helpful, but not as strong as, as changing the structures and the governance and the intent mm. center or the education that allows organizations to to think differently about what they produce, how they produce, et cetera. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's, those are very good points. I'm just conscious of time, but kind of before wrapping up, I also wanted to ask you uh, just a little bit about governance and institutions and you it seems like a lot of the institutions that we have they just they aren't working properly for you know the the digital age analog kind of institutions whether whether or not we talk about the you know post world war 2 institutions or national institutions and but institutions are important right and governance is sure. important and we we can't do this one set of stakeholders, we're talking about ch climate change or whatever the, the global challenge is, one set of stakeholders isn't going to be able to fix it and so, or get us to a better place. And so, you know, maybe a philo slightly philosophical, but, but maybe let's just take it back to a practical. I was thinking about phrasing this question in more of practical terms terms in, in that if someone is listening to this and maybe they're a policymaker or maybe they're they they have some some role in institution building or something along those lines you know how would they be able to use some of your work to and, and maybe apply it yeah so it's key because indeed a lot of the debates is people are oh, anti-tech relying on tech for mm -hmm. this or regulation or you know not realizing that you need to intervene mm -hmm. at the different levels of of um, the levers for change. And of course, regulation and governance plays a key role. So I think there are different, different levels to that. And we spend quite a lot of time, including with organizations like IBM and, and NASA and others on, on thinking about some of these topics. But the, I think it, it boils down to a number of things, right? So it boils down to number one, thinking more futures and foresight than just strategic planning. Mm -hmm. So You'll find countries, you know, like Singapore, Finland, Canada, and the U.S. Is, is improving it. The U.K. as well, but it's more capability than kind of throughout the entire government and systems are starting to have, you know, foresight. But 
The important thing about foresight and futures as a kind of capability, I mean, um, but the important thing about it is, is really to move from just having a few people or department or budget who are thinking about these topics versus, you know, so everything we've talked about, you know, futures thinking or foresight um, versus having it embedded in, in government and policy. So, you know, is it just a few people you pick their brain on for something? Right. Yeah, yeah. Are they, you know, is it like Wales that you have a ministry that's responsible for future generations? Is it like Finland that as part of the parliament, you have people focused mm -hmm. and they have certain rights and they inform legislation and they're looking 50 years ahead? Is it like UAE? Not that UAE is, is perfect for, for governance, but from a kind of futures perspective, they have a ministry looking just at the future, thinking about 50, 100 years, and that's driving mm -hmm. the other ministry. So one thing is kind of embedding the, the mindset, the philosophy, et cetera, again, because education is so important. The second thing is that there's no kind of isolated answer or, or fix. So you need to have ecosystems whereby the government is playing a role alongside private stakeholders. Um, the, the gentleman who did the, um, the second um, forward of our book, he initially set up, he was a PhD in futures, and initially set up the, the futures practice with the Air Force in the DAD. It was the first time. So you're starting to have that. And what's very interesting is that, you know, historically, a lot of the military, everything is classified, etc. He was starting to think about, okay, what are those areas where we need to work very closely with private, with technology, with companies, and what does need to be classified and what doesn't? So once you have embedded that capacity, it's interacting with the rest of the ecosystems. And then, right. sadly, the third most important thing, and this is a tricky one, especially in the US, because lobbying is borderline synonymous <laughs> with, with corruption, is, is really understanding that incentives determine outcomes. Yeah. You know, when you have, you know, the rightful lobby paying senators and the legislation, which is kind of reluctant to whatever, we know exactly where that is. When we have certain of 10 companies that are driving X percent of the emissions and that are influencing through whatever think tank and that that becomes legislation. So again, it's systemic, it's understanding some mm. things we talked about, um, all that is, is linked. There's no quick fix, but the more people understand that, think like that, operate in these open ecosystems, for those who are in good faith, they're more likely than not gonna be able to do something more effective than if they weren't aware of these things. Okay, sure. Uh, those are some, again, some really good points. Um, just, um, I think it's probably a good place to to uh, wrap up. But mm -hmm. um, was there anything that you wanted to mention you don't think that we got a chance to cover? Well, no, first, thanks so much. I mean, we covered a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. There's there's always a million things and that. But I think it was, a, you know, for those <laughs> the patients or interest to stay until the end, uh, a big thank you and, and for covering all that. I think... The only thing I would say is that um, a lot of what we talked about, we've tried our best to democratize. We've tried our best to have even available for free on social media. Okay. So if you Google Disruptive Futures Institute, mm -hmm. if you Google Thriving on Disruption, which is kind of the publication, and um, whether you want to buy the publication, listen to courses, go to YouTube, social media, you should hopefully find a lot. We're going to serialize um, some of our work um, on Substack. We're thinking about you know, podcasts and other kind of media scaling on the media and content side. So if you're interested in these topics, please feel free to stay tuned and then a lot of it will, will be accessible and free. Fantastic. And, and Roger, if people are interested in you and, and your work, uh, what are some of the other places to follow you and get in touch and all of that? Good stuff. No, that's great. I'm trying to be quite as responsive as I can. LinkedIn is not a bad place. Um, we have pages for Tech Essential, which is our foresight practice. We have pages for Disruptive Fusion Institute, which is the educational and content. You can write to us. Usually there's a place to kind of get in, get in touch with. We offer courses. We offer consulting. I sit on different boards and all kinds of things. And we do our best to be as, as responsive and helpful and relevant um, for anything that we can support on. Fantastic. Roger, this was great. I really appreciate you taking the time. Wish you all the best and congratulations again on a great piece of work. Thanks so much, Ben. Thanks for having me. And I hope this, this is helpful for, for any listeners. I, I'm sure. I'm sure it will. Thanks so much. All right. I hope you enjoyed that and found it useful. Once again, the book is called The Definitive Guide to Thriving on Disruption, Essential Frameworks for Disruption and Uncertainty. Links are in the show notes 
as usual. Let me know what you think. And if you enjoyed this episode and if you enjoy the show, please share it. That always helps us out an awful lot. There's a lot happening with me and with the show and other things which I will share with you over the next few months. So if you haven't yet subscribed to All Things Risk, please do so. We will be back soon. Until then, and as always, don't forget, risk is life.